This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. And welcome back to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, starting the new year recording in a snowstorm. Today, it's all about that bass, or bass, and Isaac Asimov. And in sync, it gets weird, y'all. Okay, let's go. Welcome back. Well, I know you guys didn't go anywhere, but I was the one who took a break. We had a lovely Christmas in our new house. It was a white Christmas and everything, and it was a perfect new year. And I just wanted to shout out a special little fan of the show, Calvin. He told me over the break that he really likes this show, and we talked quite a bit about some of the cool things that he learned. So Calvin, stay curious, bud. So for this week, we are getting right into it. And it's all about that bass, which is spelled bass. It's spelled the same, and it's said different depending on the context. And in this context, bass is bass. It's a robotic bass with the potential to make a lot of things better in ecology or a lot of things worse. So let's find out how right Isaac Asimov was when it came to doomsday robots, shall we? Learning the lessons of introducing invasive species to a habitat, like cane toads in episode 18, rabbits in Australia, the curly-tailed lizard who was number one in producing a large number two in episode 22, episode 23 where invasive killer bees were hurting the Lear's macaw, and episode 31 where honeybees were using twerking to murder murder hornets, another invasive species. You know what? Pretty much every episode of Bewilderbeast brings up invasive species in some way, and the subsequent, well, let's introduce an animal in a there was a little old lady who swallowed a fly manner to dispose it, kill it, knock it out, obliterate the invasive population. And it almost always backfires spectacularly, leaving a population of new animals who have zero natural predators to thrive, eat whatever's around, make babies, and decimate the natural ecology. Yay! Well, let's take a look at the mosquito fish. They are a teeny three centimeter long, which is kind of about the size of two aspirin pills, a third of a golf tee, or going the other way, 55 mosquito fish equals one Napoleon. They certainly can't do any damage, right? They get their name apparently from eating mosquito larvae, so you would think this would be great news. Hallelujah! podcast adjourned. Later days. See you next week. What robots? Oh, we're done here, right? Well, mosquito fish eat mosquitoes, which is a big yay. Big enough yay to make other regions think, hmm, malaria? That's not great. How about we get these teeny tiny little wee fish into our waterways? But mosquito fish also have in their name mosquito. And like the flying version of the little blood suckers, they are super annoying. In the case of Australia, the introduction of mosquito fish may have actually made the mosquito problem worse. See, the mosquito fish outcompeted native mosquito predators who ate more mosquitoes. So those native fish died off. The mosquito fish happened to eat mosquito larvae, but also eat fish tails, essentially slowly killing native fish because they can't swim without a tail. Rude. They also happened to nibble off the tails of tadpoles. What did they do, huh? And eat eggs of other freshwater fishes. These now invasive species were easily able to adapt 
This left a big hole for the mosquito fish to just like have more mosquito fish babies, go to town eating everything in sight, and the mosquitoes got worse. To top it all off, they have a super quick breeding cycle. Females reach sexual maturity in about three to four weeks, so if she has 60 babies and 25 of them are female, in three weeks, each of those other females are ready to go with a new batch of little hellion babies who are utterly destroying the ecosystem. This means that they are in the top 100 invasive species worldwide. That's really bad. So looking at you, snakes in the Everglades, hippos roaming through Colombia, and one we're dealing with here in Maine, the brown-tailed moth caterpillar, which is so dangerous, just breathing their hairs that might be floating through the air can cause respiratory distress in sensitive people. Here's a quick blurb about these little jerks from Maine.gov's website. The brown-tailed moth is an invasive species found only in the coast of Maine and Cape Cod. This moth is an insect of both forest and human health concerns. The brown-tailed moth caterpillar has tiny poisonous hairs that cause dermatitis similar to poison ivy on sensitive individuals. People may develop dermatitis from direct contact with the caterpillar or indirectly from contact with airborne hair. The hairs become airborne after either being dislodged from the living or dead caterpillar, or they just come from cast skins with the caterpillar molt. Ew. Most people affected from the hairs develop a localized rash, which will last for a few hours up to several days. But for some people, that rash can be so severe and last for several weeks. The rash results from both a chemical reaction and a toxin in the hair and a physiological irritation as the barbed hairs become embedded in the skin. I am not looking forward to that this summer. Funny enough, at least to me, the brown-tailed moth was introduced to Somerville, Massachusetts in 1897 on accident. That's the town I just spent close to 20 years living in. It's only found in Cape Cod and Maine. The moths basically went dormant and weren't a thing, but since 2020 was a year of so, so many gifts, with the dry conditions and not many diseases affecting the caterpillars in the larva stage, unlike the diseases that were running rampant through the people stage, they had a great year and have been thriving much to everyone else's disappointment and fear. So, now we know a little bit about what bad invasive species can do while they're using their powers for evil, though usually not their fault. This is the one case I've read that someone in charge did not suggest, hey, let's take their natural predator, the largemouth bass, and add that bad boy to the mix. See where this goes. See, we've learned that lesson time and 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 time again. We did not, however, learn any lessons from Isaac Asimov, the robot guy who like consistently had written about the robot apocalypse. And when I say largemouth bass, if you were to picture or Google it, you would see the traditional picture of a giant fish, maybe a greenish or darkish in color, super wide mouth open. It kind of looks like a basketball hoop. It's so wide. You have seen this fish on every magazine catalog catering to the love of fishing and hunting and the water. Heck, it's even the don't worry, be happy fish that you probably gifted your Uncle Bob one Christmas as a gag gift. Anyway, definitely the fish on the Bass Pro Shops catalog because it's in the name. Bass. That fish. Big fella. When I saw the images of the robot fish in the news, it didn't look like it was that big. It looked a bit like a white zombified fish. It had red eyes, freaky looking, kind of like a kid made a ghost version of a largemouth bass. But I really wanted to see this thing move. And that's when I stumbled onto a talk by Dr. Giovanni Pulverino one of the scientists behind RoboBass. He says of RoboBass, quote, it looks like a $3 toy my daughter would play with. And he's right. But he also held up a very small white toy fish. It looks to be a couple of inches long, the length of a finger perhaps. This is not exactly menacing, like the couple of feet that I have seen in some of these pictures of like big bass fishing guys, like on Twitter or literally anywhere showing off their big catch. I think it's more like a lance bass, smaller than you'd think for the job he needs to do, eyes that pop out in photos and white tips. And for those who don't know or were born after 1997, which might actually be many of you, Lance Bass sang bass. 
remarkably using both pronunciations of the word B-A-S-S for a boy band called InSync. So, Robobass goes swimming through the water. Dana, 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 Dana. You know how this goes. And while you might think Robo Predator would eat the mosquito fish, it doesn't work that way. Instead, the faux fish absolutely terrifies the invasive species to the point where they find it hard to hear Barry White singing over all that creepy, don't go in there horror music. They basically are just a bouncer, a bodyguard, the chaperone at a seventh grade dance that won't allow for any funny business. They are the birth control, which prevents the fish from being able to mate because they're just too scared. They simply cannot. But what about the native fish? Well, as the mosquito fish have an instinctive fear of the way that the largemouth bass moves and looks, much like when a cat sees a cucumber and thinks it's a snake, they jump, they get scared. Kids do not put cucumbers in front of your cat, it's mean, but it does illustrate my point of how when you see something that is close enough to what you might be instinctively afraid of, the fear response just goes full blast. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever just seen something rustle in the grass and scream only to realize it's like a paper bag or something? Or for me, sometimes a string moves out of the corner of my eye and I think, ah, spider! But it's just like the fringe on a small cat toy. It happens to the best of us. So as the LMB, which I'm calling largemouth bass, has never, ever, ever been a thing in Australian fish, they've never had to worry about it genetically. They have... They have other fish to fry, as it were. They were afraid of other things, but not this fish, or even the wee little facsimile. So when the Robo Bass was released, the native fish were like, hey, what's up, fishes? Who's the new guy? He seems kind of quiet. While the mosquito fish school, scream, and stay in the middle of the tank. (laughs) And if they had fish pants, they would poop in them out of sheer fear. It's not just a toy fish in the tank. This thing moves like an LMB. It behaves like an LMB. One other thing you can't do as easily if you're terrified in the face of a predator is successfully mate. And as a result, RoboBass is swimming, gaping mouth, white zombie fish form, mosquito fish, birth control. They cannot pass on their genes, but native fishes are able to reclaim some of the spaces left vacant from the plague of mosquito fish, which will either net them all living a little bit more in balance, even though there is an invasive species, or they will just no longer survive, which is fine too as far as the ecosystem is concerned. Currently, this idea is being floated to be trialed in very small ponds, not full waterways that sprawl and are connected by rivers. So someone's little fishing pond on a farm, instead of, say, Lake Erie that connects to rivers and streams and other ponds and all of the other Great Lakes. As Robo Bass has been tested in laboratories only, much like the Powerpuff Girls, and that worked out really well, the hope is to expand, but slowly. Humans may have learned a lot from previous mistakes introducing a species to combat other species, but what we haven't learned yet, at all, is from our friend Isaac Asimov and all the AI robot apocalypse stuff. At least yet. That, and in a bigger system, the greater likelihood of robo-fish getting eaten by a shark or a trout or some dude catching it with his fishing rod and making that his the worst dating profile picture ever. Just holding a teeny tiny freaky robo-zombie fish, like spark zapping off of it, guy looking at early confused, everyone swiping left on that. So the environmental impact of fish eating robo-parts is a potential issue also of great environmental concern. There are small ponds in Western Australia, including one that is home to the Edge Baston Gobi. This is a small yet critically endangered fish. And releasing this robot into the bodies of water in the future might actually help protect this native species from the mosquito fish. So does this have any real practical applications? aside from saving fish? And the answer is potentially yes. We are currently using robotic fish that are designed to withstand over a thousand times that of the pressure on the sea's surface. That pressure would crush our skulls, and even the most rigid robots wouldn't stand a chance against that pressure. 
but with soft robots made of special polymers that deform under pressure, kind of get squishy. They don't snap or break. They are able to house recording equipment so we can see the unexplored depths of the ocean. This is something that we haven't been able to realistically do due to the aforementioned intense pressure, but also the extra cold temperatures and really strong ocean currents. It's hard to build survivable, usable, affordable exploration stuff for those conditions. But a cute little robot fish designed after the Hadal snailfish, armed with a camera, was able to plunge and explore the depths of the Mariana Trench. This is the lowest point on planet Earth. And it was able to withstand that depth and temperature and cold for 45 minutes. And in the case of the Mariana test, the robot was able to kind of explore. It was mounted on a deep sea lander, so it couldn't just zip around freely, but it was able to just kind of flap and move for 45 minutes, which is a great sign and a successful test. There are some things that do need adjusting before it can swim with the fishes, as it were. And to do its job, it's difficult to steer and maneuver, so that needs to be adjusted. It was also quite slow, which makes sense given the conditions, but still. And most concerning is without the sea lander it was mounted to, it's unlikely it would have been able to navigate the ocean with the impossibly strong deep sea current. These currents could take Dora Explorer fish for an unintended ride. The good news? It does look like these improvements can be made and implemented to make this little swimmer a tool in human exploration on the sea floor. And one other variation on the theme of using the non-living as a method of protecting native animals from invasive predators? After World War II, a snake, or likely several, hitched a ride on a boat heading to Guam. Now, Guam is a United States territory closer to Japan and Korea and the Philippines than it is to any United States state. And as Guam has zero snake predators, the snakes had babies and ate and thrived on all the native birds, including a hyper little bird called the Rufus Fantail. Cute little thing, but these brown tree snakes decimated a subspecies of the fantail. No other will ever twit, flit, or fly again. The forests are quiet, twitless, tweetless? I think you get what I'm trying to say, they are now extinct. In a mad dash, as fast as a flighty, flit-winged, feathered fantail can flit, researcher Lindsay Nietman is trying to sort out why the same birds in Australia got their babies out of the nest on an average two to three days sooner, which might not seem like a lot, but that's three days longer for a large snake to find the nest, eat the babies, and have a great meal, while taking away an entire generation of endangered birdlets. And to test how the Australian rufous fantails compare to the known predators and new predators, including the very same snakes that ate the Guamian bird cousins, Lindsay is using a unique method, taxidermy chipmunks. She strapped a dead chipmunk to a pole and is using it to see if she could scare birds. As worded in the ABC article, quote, it is a bizarre sight watching a taxidermy chipmunk slide towards a nest on a piece of plastic pipe in the middle of the Australian rainforest, but Ms. Nietman believes her study could explain the species' survival. I love science. After all, if you can tell that a chipmunk is murderous straight away, it gives you a chance to take evasive action and over time, save your species. I personally am here more for the taxidermy on a stick apocalypse. It's a little less real than anything Asimov wrote. And after 2021, that's about the only apocalypse fiction I can handle right now. But back to Robo Bass. If this works in the self-contained ponds, Perhaps we can use a modified version of this to help reduce populations of other invasive species, like the lionfish, which is a whole thing, or snakes in the Everglades that have absolutely gone rogue. But how do you scare a snake? Beats me. Maybe some of these invasive species need other technologies, like holograms. I mean, we don't want sea turtles accidentally eating a robot that might be there to help them in the long run, right, by protecting their eggs? Oh my god, we have a holographic Tupac somewhere, right, that hasn't been brought out in a while? Can we see what he can do underwater? For science? But I do have an idea for the feral cat colonies that are killing birds. Could someone whip up a cucumber robot? (coughs) 
So thanks for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. Hey, you listened to this whole thing, or maybe you just hit skip a bunch of times, but either way, check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash bewilderbeasts. Bonus episodes for everyone at a dollar a month, extra goodies like letters, stickers, personal RSS feed for episodes that are made just for you. I just recorded one on a grindcore goat that was saved from the slaughterhouse. It's really wild. This cool punk rock goat ended up getting eulogized in a way that I really hope to be someday. Um, but you also get my eternal gratitude. But for everyone, if there are topics you are interested in hearing about on the show, know of historical animals who change the world, animals who help humans, other ways science absolutely does not backfire at all, send it in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeast on Facebook, and bewilderbeast on Instagram. Hey, I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with What Stuff Media. I have missed you. Now go get curious. I got today's information from thesaurus.com, arstechnica.com, smithsonianmag.com, newscientist.com, mentalfloss.com, youtube.com, has a great video by Dr. Giovanni Paul Vervino for the University of Western Australia that shows this little robofish. And I should shout out, let's go to court, as I'm confident that's why Lance Bass is on my mind. It's a running joke throughout their Not For Children Crime podcast, but it's all I could hear in my head every time I said pass. Main.gov, inverse.com, and abc.net. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz. Interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music provided by Pixabay and freesound.org. Don't forget to like and subscribe and review and share with your curious friends. Please, please, please. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week. Bye.